Welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm John Lynn, together with my colleague and friend, Colin Hung. The world of technology and healthcare ever changing in new and novel ways, and that's why we love this stuff. So join us as we discuss the latest healthcare and health IT news, meshed together in new ways which help generate ideas and new perspectives. Plus, we'll have a little fun along the way. Today, we're going to be talking about busting myths for entrepreneurs, especially those that are new to healthcare. And be sure to follow the show on social media at the hashtag HITSM and our personal accounts at TechGuy and at Colin underscore Hung. Plus, check out our 18 years of health IT blog content at healthcareitoday.com. Is this the uh, disgruntled episode? We're too old and in healthcare for too long, so we have to complain about... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's definitely the episode, John, where you and I are going to come across as like old curmudgeons, right? Like we're just like we're so jaded, we're so like still have our you know, teeth. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> we're I mean, the, you and I probably have a different. In the Muppets, in the <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Like we, I mean, I I suspect that when we talk to young entrepreneurs who are you know all excited about doing something to change healthcare, and then we hear we come along like that's just never going to work. Like, What's interesting is like even scarier is like the older entrepreneurs that maybe sold a company in another industry that come to healthcare and they're like, oh crap, that doesn't work here. And you're like, no. <laughs> that is that is so right. Um, in fact, that actually is a great kickoff, John. Like the one myth that I always have to bust for people whenever they come up to me is that just because you built something better that doesn't actually mean it's going to be successful in healthcare because healthcare is littered with everything, with devices, with software, with even medications that were better than what was available and that they've gone nowhere. So just building a better mousetrap, not a solution for healthcare. <laughs> yeah, the one that's really hard for me, it's it's related to yours, I think. And uh, it, it is like embarrassing to even say this out loud on a podcast that's going to be recorded forever. But it's 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 just the reality that so many people face. And that is, if you improve care, they may or may not adopt it, right? Like, I think so many people come in, well, if I improve care for the patients, then everyone's going to want to adopt it. And I'm really sad to say that's not always true. Right. Like they want that too. Right. Like you can't, you can't reduce the quality of care. You can't, you can't make it worse. Right. But, uh, you know, it turns out, you know, the economics rule over even the effectiveness of the treatment or the effectiveness of the tool that helps to do it. So that, that's a scary and sad reality for healthcare. It's so true. So, so John, what are some other cold splashes of water? That, that you've had to tell entrepreneurs that's so that's kind of hard for them to accept about healthcare. Yeah, to me, I think the other biggest like shock to the system is how the decision making happens. So like, you know, they think, oh, well, the doctor could just like this and adopt it. And the doctor makes a decision almost never. I mean, they do clinically. So they, they, they you know, it's true for pharma, med device, maybe some of those, right? But for health IT solutions, the doctor, in many cases, has no input <laughs> or they're on a committee or they have a survey, you know, like it's usually the administrators or the CMIO or the CMO that kind of represents the doctor voice. In smaller medical practices, that can be true where the doctor is the decision maker. So if you're selling into ambulatory practices that you can do that, but then they bump into a different issue, which is the doctor doesn't really care about 2% more efficiency, you know, or like a better patient experience, like that doesn't actually move the needle for them on what they're trying to accomplish in a small practice. So I think those are the biggest things is that, you know, it's such a common phrase that the, there's no one in healthcare that can say yes, and everyone can say no. And, and that there, there's committees of people who can say no, and you have to get over all of them. So I think that's the biggest shock to the system is how long it takes to get people to approve stuff and how many people you have to cajole and convince to get a product into the market. Well, and I would even say, you know, first of all, you're absolutely right. Like even something as simple simple as a consumable, uh, you know, 
gauze, bandages, and those kinds of things. Yes, you can convince a doc to say they like it, but it still has to get through the procurement people who may already have a 10-year relationship that they signed unbeknownst to that doc, right? <laughs> like, so you, you, like you said, that person can say no, even though the doctor who's in charge of it goes yes, right? Even if you get clinical buy-in to certain things. So it may even be better for the patient. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so yeah, decision by committee, you know, healthcare is definitely enterprise selling, which is a bit hard for people who come from the B2C world, like who sell directly to consumers. Uh, that's probably one of the, you know, one of the things that's hard for them to accept. Along the same lines, you and I have talked about this before. Any business model, model that's predicated on the patient paying for something is very, very difficult. And again, similar to what you just said before, a lot of entrepreneurs come into healthcare going, well, you know, hey, patients who have this condition will totally spend $300 to buy this device or buy this software or buy this tracking tool. And I'm like, yeah, there's probably a few that will do that. But the majority probably aren't. I mean, a lot of us need to lose weight and yet none of us are signing up. Like just, we still lots of us who don't go to the gym, right? So even though it might be better for someone's health, that's not a guarantee that they're actually going to fork out real money to adopt a solution. So I'm always cautionary of entrepreneurs to say, hey, listen, it's not a bad idea to try and go after patients, but if that's your sole source of net revenue, that's going to be a very tough road. Yeah, and I would relate that to another aspect, which is, basically just more broadly that people don't understand how healthcare gets paid for, you know, whether, you, like you said, the, the patient doesn't pay for it, won't pay for it, you know, unlikely to pay for it. Right. Like, but also, you know, they go to the payers, you know, I love those. We're going to go to the payers. We're going to lower the cost for them. And then they hear about the formula that says, oh, we're only allowed to charge so much. The rest has to be used on costs. And I actually want my cost to increase because then my revenue increases. They're like, what? How, how does that work? And you're like, yeah, it doesn't work. Unintended side, side effect of Obamacare. But, you know, like anyway, just understanding how stuff gets paid for and, and what the models are for how a healthcare organization pays for things. That's the other thing that's a shock to the system. Uh, you know, some I was reading something. It's like, is healthcare a market? And my answer is no. It's not a true market because it doesn't follow market forces. It, it's very different. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is, like, I do a course where I teach um, healthcare economics, and it's just all around how does reimbursement work, right? Really, it's a it really is a course on how does reimbursement work in healthcare. We talk about CPT codes, or I talk about CPT codes. I talk about the whole submitting a claim. And you should see people's jaws drop when we talk about well, you, you have to code. And if, unless there's a code for it, they're not being paid for it, right? So that's why doctors and that's why organizations do certain things and don't do other things, right? Um, you know, and, and so they're like, well, okay, well, then I'll just go get a new code. And I'm like, well, getting a new code <laughs> and getting reimbursed for that code is actually harder than getting an FDA approval for your medical device. Like it is long and difficult. And even if you get a code, there's no guarantee someone's actually going to reimburse against it. So that is another cold splash of water that people just don't understand the whole mechanism of how healthcare gets paid. Yeah. And you look at even like digital therapeutics and, you know, was it pair healthcare, pair therapeutics? I forget. They renamed themselves three times. But you know, like they even had a code. <laughs> they had the science, they had everything, and they still couldn't figure out the model to work uh, to be able to implement that. So it, it's definitely an uphill battle, even if you have the code, even if you have the reimbursement. That the you know, and then the other thing that's interesting is these hospital and health systems, they only deal with like the top five priorities. Everything else is like secondary. So getting them to buy something outside of these top five priorities that are listed in the boardroom, like it, it's tough to go beyond that. Well, and, you know, the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, healthcare definitely is a giant industry, right? They, you know, you hear the the numbers when you see the, those, uh, you know, the market reports, right? You know, it's going to go by X KGAR, right? And now all this other stuff this year, like, and how many billions or percentage of uh, GDP healthcare is taking definitely a very large industry as a whole but not every part of healthcare is swimming in these dollars right like we you and i both know there's not a lot of money spent in behavioral health still there's not a lot of money spent on senior care long-term care home care like 
all in all of these kinds of niche areas of healthcare don't get a lot of dollars flowing down to them. And so I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs lately, like really have come up with solutions to say, Oh, I'm going to sell this into community care organizations. I'm like, that's great. But those people have very little budget to operate on. So you're going to have to conform to that reality of the market. And they're like, Oh, what do you mean? Like my, my product's 10 times better. And I'm like, yeah, but it's also 10 times the cost. And that's just not going to fly in that budget. Um, so th that's another reality where I'm throwing cold water on them to say not all parts of healthcare are created equal in terms of budget. <laughs> then they get really excited to work in healthcare. But, you know, the other thing that's happening right now, Colin, is that, you know, it's, it's kind of a tough time. Like when I talk to people, you know, funding has dried up, uh, you know, there's lots of layoffs happening. I think that's true across a lot of segments, not just healthcare, you know, a lot of technology companies laying off people. And, and that's true in, in health IT as well. I mean, I know in our Sway Health community, there's a lot of marketing people losing jobs that we, you know, we obviously try to connect them. But, you know, how do you see it? Is is now a good time to start a new company given all of these kind of, I, I think in many of us say it's just a weird time in healthcare because it's not like healthcare goes away. It doesn't disappear. Like you still need healthcare, but it is, you know, weird margins, layoffs, et cetera. So what do you think? Yeah, so so I'm gonna have a, a, a caveat answer. So I would, of course, it's never a great time to start a company. I don't, I think if you waited for the perfect time to start a company, you'd never do it. Like it would just never come along, right? Or the entrepreneur, it's always a good time to start a company. Yeah, or the entrepreneur <laughs> way, it's always a good time. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. I, I would say right now, it's a great time to start a company in healthcare if you're building it in a way that does not require, it's not dependent on funding. Mm -hmm. Because that is something that's very difficult today. Like you, the multiples you now have to generate in healthcare are quite big. Like, cause they're comparing you to, well, if I could spend a dollar in healthcare versus a dollar in consumer tech, where do you think they're gonna put the dollar, right? Like you've got to earn the same multiples. And we know in healthcare, it's really difficult to earn the multiples that you can get in other industries. So I, I my advice would be, you know, is, is this a great time? Is this a good time? It can be if you're creating a company that's predicated more on winning customers and support being able to support yourself through customer revenue as opposed to continual rounds of funding. Because if you have to do that, then I think this isn't a great time, just given where everyone has retreated from investing in those types of companies in healthcare. Yeah, the money is not flowing the way it was. So if you're looking for funding, that's definitely harder. So I mean, it's interesting, that gives a, a little bit of an opportunity for those who have their own self-funding, you know, that have you know, they can, you can bootstrap it better than others. Uh, but I actually think that's probably what excites me most right now is mm. that the tools that are available and the opportunity to scale something up quickly are just dramatically better than they were even five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. You know, when you think about the way cloud has lowered the cost to be able to roll something out, the way AI is being able to provide solutions that were often are often very cheap right now. You know, like I don't know how long that window is going to stay open. That's a different question for another day. But right now, AI and the solutions there are pretty cheap to use and to apply to healthcare. You know, there's some exceptions depending on how how you want to scale it up. Uh, there's certain things that do need a, a large investment and a lot of GPUs that are expensive. But you know, for a lot of the solutions, and there's a lot of low hanging fruit in healthcare. Let's be honest. Like, if you know, you can do it with the technology that's out there today in a way that five years ago you would have been like, no, nah, the data is not there. The data is not available. The processing power is not available. I got to invest what to see if this works now? Yeah, you could invest a pretty small amount of money, bootstrap it and see if it works and implement it in the hospital. And, and so in that regard, it's a really exciting time. The other thing that's exciting, since I'm the uh, the uh, happy-go-lucky Pollyanna guy here and you're, you're the curmudgeon Colin. <laughs> no, the other, the other nice thing is, and this is a little sad for those people that are affected for sure, but the amount of talent that's available right now that has been cut from other companies and has been laid off and whole teams laid off in, in some cases, like, the amount of talent you can get to support you in your efforts is, is is awesome. And so there is an opportunity there to take advantage of all these layoffs 
in a way that, uh, you know, allows them to maybe even be more entrepreneurial. You know, a lot of these people that get laid off and decide, hey, we want to be entrepreneurs too. And so you can combine forces and go after it in a, in a low cost way uh, versus what you could do years ago. So that part is exciting to me. Yeah. And then just to go back to something you said there, you know, John, you're absolutely right. It is far easier today to create a new product than it was in, back in the old days, right? Like there's AWS, right? There's Microsoft's Azure platform. There's Google Cloud. You can build products on there. There's even companies like MedStack that have already a HIPAA compliant medical, uh, you know, uh, back end that you can build products on. There's companies like Nuance that build APIs to their tools and companies like Redox, right? That allow you to do all the interoperability stuff. So you can start off way higher in the functionality because you don't have to build all that stuff like you did before right like you can even use pure storage right for all your back-end storage if you're doing something with very large images and that kind of thing so you're absolutely right that it's never it's never been better in terms of a better starting point if you're a technology-based organization yeah and you also add in like a lot of them have incubators and stuff right like, there's all these mm chat gbt incubators or you know gen ai ones or you know aws has you know investments we get pitches all the time they're like we're part of the google cloud investment right. fund that you've never heard about right or or you know it's like some side program where they've invested or they've offered some services or whatever so i think those opportunities are are really great as well for you know entrepreneurs to be able to scale it quickly if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Healthcare IT Today with John Lin and Colin Hung. Today, we're discussing the cold, harsh reality of healthcare and busting a few myths for entrepreneurs. And hey, if you want to have your company, product, or executive to be heard at HIMSS, well, Healthcare IT Today can help you with, with cutting through the noise at, at that event and making sure that your stories are seen and heard by the most important people in health IT. Reach out to us via our Contact Us page at healthcareittoday.com. And don't delay, Hims is just around the corner. Can't wait. Conference Can't wait for it. Can't put Orlando. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it's fun to see friends. <laughs> so, John, let me ask you this. Uh, what advice would you actually give to somebody who's on the verge of starting something or wanting to start something in healthcare? So, you know, maybe this is an extension of, of our last topic as well, but I think one of the amazing things now that's happened is that it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to get your message out there. Sure, over time, if you want to scale up, then you're going to have to invest in, in, in some marketing efforts, but as you're starting, you can get the message out there, especially if you have a unique perspective on what's happening you know, publications like ours at Healthcare IT Today want to share it. We, you know, we love supporting new entrepreneurs as well and hearing new stories and perspectives that we hadn't seen before, right? Like that's that's always fun. And so there, and then even beyond that, there are all these social tools to be able to share your message for nothing, right? It's, it's, the, it's nothing in the sense of the effort required to tell your story. So I think that's powerful. And then the other is, before you needed to fly out to the hospital and then meet with the board and then meet with the CIO and whoever you wanted to meet with to be able to kind of make the case. I've actually seen where many companies are, are going to the CMIO. Hey, we're going to fly out there and we'd love to meet with you. And the CMIO is, don't do that. Just hop on Zoom. Let's have a conversation. Like, yeah, maybe down the road we could meet up, right? But let's do all that initial due diligence and understand what you're doing and what makes you unique on Zoom. So, you know, to me, that that's an interesting shift in mindset. It, it, it is a powerful thing that most people have accepted. And in fact, if you fly out there, then the CIO almost feels obligated. And, and that's not actually a good place to sell from. They're like, oh, I did this begrudgingly. That That's not great. Whereas they know if it's a Zoom, hey, it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, right? And then that they can go get back. But if you're out there, they're like, okay, it's an hour. Then I'm probably going to do lunch. I got to, you know, you might need to invite someone else. Like that's more of a burden on them than just the Zoom call, which is why I think many have embraced it. So take advantage of these virtual options to be able to share your message. No, that's a good, that's good advice. That's good advice. My, my advice would be not to plug it too much, but you definitely need to go to a healthcare conference, whether that's Vive, Hims, Health, like any of the big ones, because time and time again, I hear entrepreneurs tell me, 
they've never seen anything else like what they're building. And I'm like, I've seen five, <laughs> right? And in fact, I was at somebody's booth and I have their, I have their tchotchke. Like it, healthcare is not like consumer industry. There's nobody other than us covering the healthcare industry all the time. And we're industry focused. We're not, we're not meant for the casual Sunday afternoon magazine reader, right? How many Whereas, times has your wife watched a video? Tell right. Me. <laughs> zero <laughs> exactly so so just because you've never heard of it don't assume that that means it doesn't exist or doesn't mean that someone's tried it normally when people come to me and, and say hey i got this wonderful product i'm able to point to at least five competitors they've never heard of that are doing almost exactly what they're doing and they're just so deflated to realize that these exist now that's not, that's not to say they should give up i'm just saying that they should be aware of that and one of the best ways to become aware of that is go to some of these bigger conferences because you'll be, then you'll know what you're up against. And it's not so much that you might find 10 competitors, but you're trying to capture the attention this, of the same person that all these thousands of other vendors are trying to get the hold of. And then you realize, oh, that's what I'm in for. I can't just show up with my product and go, it's better than why, because there are 12 other products that are have a way bigger ROI than mine. Right. And that poor CIO or CMIO or chief financial officer is going to go, well, that one's promising me 80% ROI and you're only at 20% ROI. Right. And they, people don't realize that. So I definitely encourage people who are going into the healthcare space, spend the money, invest the time, go to at least one of these conferences to truly understand what you're up against in terms of capturing that attention. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of something I've seen a lot where you, you tell them that story, right? Hey, I've seen five of these, right? <laughs> and they're like, no, but we're different, right? We're, we're different. And we we take this angle and, and you look at it and you're like, oh, that is kind of a different angle to address the problem. But then what I like to remind them is that, okay, that might be a different way to approach the problem, but it's still the same problem. And so, you know, whether you can do it better, going back to our previous discussion, <laughs> but better than the others, if they're solving the same problem and they're saying the same messages, you know, then you have to find a way to stand out. And that, that can be challenging. You, you know, my best advice for especially new founders is to get a customer as quick as you can you know, okay. ideally, I think we've covered this before, ideally a large health system, medium health system, you know, or hospital and a, a rural one, you know, you go for the kind of tri triumvirate. And so you have one so that it, it solves so many problems. Because when you go to the press, can I have a customer? Sure. When you go to a, a, a prospect, you're like, oh, do you have anyone like me doing it? Yeah, here you go. You know, do you, it, it just helps so much. And Healthcare does feel like it's a unique little snowflake. And even within healthcare, like you said, there's like dozens of markets within healthcare. The large health system is a very different market than the rural health system. Sure, some products can span both, but for the most part, they're very different value propositions and discussion. And, and so they want to know that there's other snowflakes like them that are similar. And maybe I shouldn't use the snowflake in this political environment, but you get the idea. So I think, you know, that's that's another thing to think about is, you know, and my advice is like get a customer as quickly as you can. If you have to beg, borrow, I don't recommend stealing, although, you know, hey, uh, you know, do what you need to that's legal to get a customer so that you can show the proof of what you're talking about. Get that logo any way you can, because that logo, that first logo is critical to your further success. And that, kind of the last thing I'll say on that, John, related to what you just mentioned, don't mistake good feedback or positive feedback about your product for buying intent, because the two are very different in healthcare. Because when you ask doctors, when you ask CMOs, CIOs in healthcare, hey, what do you think of this? And you show them your product or the concept of your product. I think a lot of them will go, yeah, you know, that's great. I, I definitely need something that improves patient care. But don't mistake that for, oh, and I'm ready to spend 100K on it. Right. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs who, who mistake that and then end up building a, a business case or a whole uh, company based on that. So where I'm going with the what advice I would give to your point, get a real paying customer and payment doesn't have to actually be dollars. It could be a payment of time. Get someone to really pony up the time to implement your solution and allow you to train their users on it. That's an investment on their point. That is very different than someone just nodding their head going, yeah, that sounds like a great concept. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Well, as we wrap up, 
what's a health IT company that you would start right now if you didn't have such a passionate love for healthcare IT today that you do? Which, of course, you never would. But if you did, what would you start right now? Gosh, that would... I mean, the easy answer for me, for people who know me, would be obviously something in the patient experience space, right? Because I love that space. It's a passion of mine. I don't know what it would be from a technology standpoint, but but I would probably gravitate towards that space. But but probably more, uh, more accurately, I would probably start a company that wasn't actually going to sell to hospitals or to uh, healthcare entities. I would actually build something that was selling to other health IT companies, <laughs> So more of a back-end play to say, hey, like this is a tool or a product that they could in embed in theirs. Because I think that would be, uh, frankly, a little bit easier to get traction on uh, rather than trying to go directly to the healthcare organizations. Oh, you want to sell the shovels to the gold miners. You don't want to- There you go. I got you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I would do something around Gen AI and, and mm. the large language models. Um, you know, I think- simplifying the processes, the, the ability to take a workflow engine and apply Gen AI and other AI tools and automation to it is so powerful. I mean, I was, you know, recently doing an interview with UiPath and he talked about every healthcare organization has two to 300 workflows that they can automate easy, right? And, and you look at that and you're like, and I think he's right, you know, like, I don't think he, I think he might actually understated the the problem and the opportunity to be able to automate this mundane you know repetitive stuff so i think that's where i would go i've always wondered could you create an interoperable network locally so that's another one that i would explore like could you create it it would have to be done locally which healthcare is local i think people forget that but could you could i go to the vegas valley and all the systems that are there and say hey let's get on board and solve one problem which is when the patient arrives at your system you don't hand them a clipboard could we all come together and do that i think it would be interesting because that's a problem that everyone wants solved and i wonder if could you do that on a local level and then expand to another locality I don't know I, I, I maybe not maybe you just run into barriers and they're like nope sorry it doesn't matter but that's another one I'd explore. I mean, I'd buy it. I'd buy that, John. I'd buy into that. <laughs> You'd sign up if if everyone was on board. That's the problem, though. That, that that's the only problem with that business is can you get everyone on board? <laughs> no, that's that's a true healthcare ax axiom, right? Can we get everyone on board and move in the same direction? Well, we're at the end of another episode, though. We could probably go on for another half hour on this, John. But uh, thanks to all of you who tuned into this episode of Healthcare IT Today. You can find more details about our show by checking out the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And please share your voice and engage with the community at healthcareittoday.com and on social media using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hong, along with my friend and health IT collaborator, John Lin. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.